Welcome everybody to F1 Nation with Damon Hill, Natalie Pinkham and myself, Tom Clarkson. Great show last week, I have to say. Um, good start. So we're off, we're off and running and you were in the paddock. You got to talk to some of the key players there and they had some interesting things to say. And now we're looking forward to the next race with a bit of a gap, two weeks. Um, and I have an admission to make. Go on, fess up, fess away. I did listen to the show, but it was only about five minutes ago that I listened to it. <laughs> <laughs> so I literally was having my breakfast because we were recording this in the morning. And uh, I literally had it on uh, 1.5. I couldn't listen to it times two. I was going to say, it would have to be double speed to get through it in time. <laughs> now I couldn't tell who it was who was talking. So it all just turned to a bit of a mash. But I honestly, I was concentrating. And, and I'm apologies for only to catching up a bit late, but a great show and uh, full of interesting stuff, as <laughs> always, Tom. <laughs> great show in double speed. <laughs> Look, what did you make of the race, Damon? Because uh, we didn't catch up with you after the after the Bahrain Grand Prix. No, well, I mean, it was it was more than it was expected in a way because we didn't think Red Bull were going to be quite as dominant as that, did we? Um, and so bad, didn't we? Well, we thought they were good, but. We just thought Ferrari could do a bit better than that and um, not too happy for Mercedes. But Aston Martin were the story. Aston Martin and Fernando Alonso brought the whole thing alive. And that is a story. That's a huge story. That's a turnaround in the natural order of things that we haven't seen for a very long time. And also, TC, I think that pre-season testing, I mean, it looks so ominous for everyone else. And then throughout the weekend, it looked like, Red Bull, by their own very high standards, were struggling. Well, no, it was interesting, wasn't it? When we caught up with Adrian Newey after the race, he, I, he did say that they had some nervous moments on Friday night. Reliability concerns uh, surrounding the power unit. Now, how much that compromised them in qualifying? Were they able to turn the power unit up to the max? We don't know. But I think they're, you know, remember that 12 months ago, neither car finished the Bahrain Grand Prix. So it seems that reliability is a concern, but my God, that car is good. Your man Adrian's done it again, at Damon. Yeah, well, he's, uh, I wish he was my man. You know, he's, uh, he's been a very successful person, hasn't he? And, uh, you know, there's so many different teams now that he's turned around and, be- and waved his magic wand over. But, you know, Christian is always at pains to point out that it's a team effort. In actual fact, I learned that actually Adrian spent more time on the suspension of this car than he did on the aerodynamics. So, and that points a little bit towards where the time comes from these days from with these cars, these big heavy cars, and the way the aerodynamics work. You know that the weight of the car becomes an issue in the slow corners. And many of the listeners will be probably quite surprised to hear this, but racing cars, there's so much time in slow corners. There's probably more time in slow corners than there is in fast corners. So work that out. You thought it was all about speed, but it's actually about, it is about speed, but it's about the slow speeds. So yeah, Adrian spent quite a lot of time on the suspension. It may be that he was working on the aerodynamic effect of the suspension, but whatever, the car looks fantastic. Yeah, it does. And and there are a lot of slow corners in Bahrain. So you may find it was the perfect storm to see Red Bull at their absolute best. And yes, Alonso was a great story, but he was still 38 seconds behind Max Verstappen at the flag. I mean, people were saying we need to, other teams to catch up. We actually need to be rooting for Sergio, don't we? Basically, is what we need to be doing. And he's going, come on, Sergio, you can put on a show for us, please. If there's anywhere that he can put on a show... It is Saudi Arabia. I mean, I think he was really unlucky last year, but for that safety car, I mean, that pole lap was nothing short of exceptional. And it remains his only pole in Formula One, but he did it in some style. I mean, to do it at a circuit so narrow, so fast, so unforgiving, he was in some kind of zone, wasn't he? Yeah, well, and actually, Pinks, let's bang this drum a little harder because he was only a tenth off Max Verstappen in qualifying uh, in Bahrain which isn't a Checo-type track. And yes, his race came undone at the start when he, he made a got too much wheel spin away from the line and got overtaken by Charles Leclerc and then got stuck behind him and blah, blah, blah. Hence, he was 12 seconds behind his teammate at the flag. We didn't really see what Checo could do in that race. So yes, as Damon says, let's, let's, let's push him along. Let's give him as much mental energy as we can. There's another thing, Tom, which you ought to point out, which is a lot, a lot of the people, if not all of the people you spoke to after Bahrain, 
Mike Crack, include uh, Adrian Newey. You know, uh, Adrian called it a sample of one. You know, Bahrain is not a typical circuit. It's, it's quite well. It's extraordinarily abrasive, and the combination of corners is is very tight and twisty. It, it, I can't think of another circuit it compares to really. So high t- rear tire day. We're going now to a circuit which has got very different um, characteristics and demands on the car. So the order will not necessarily be exactly uh, as it was uh, in Bahrain. I don't know if you guys agree, but I think we are seeing a different Fernando Alonso this year. I haven't heard him in any previous team be so team spirited as he is at the minute. All of the mentions about Lance Stroll, which was a phenomenal story, let's not forget, but all of the mentions of Lance Stroll, all the referring back to the the job that everyone at Silverstone has done for that team, the references to, to Lawrence Stroll, the guy behind it all. I mean, is there a more perfect match in Formula One than Lawrence Stroll and Fernando Alonso? Two hyper competitive people I see it as a, the perfect marriage myself. I don't know what you guys think. Well, I mean, I agree. And I'd love to see how this develops. They're two very, very strong characters. I hope they don't go on to clash. I mean, Fernando says they've known each other a long time. So they clearly know what makes the other one tick. I think there's a couple of reasons behind this. One is that Fernando's grateful for this opportunity at this stage of his career. You know, he's actually found himself in a competitive car and he can leave on his own terms and on a high, which is what all racing drivers want, right? The other thing, and he said this to me about a year ago, is he said that, now I've actually always found him really easy to interview. I, I, I find him a joy to interview because he gives you so much more than you than you ask for because, I don't know, he's quite sort of perceptive and aware. But he did say that since leaving and coming back, he'd become much more aware of how difficult the journalist's job is, the, or the broadcaster's job is, um, and therefore he's much more sympathetic to them now. It also helps that he's dating Andrea from Austrian Telly, who is such a lovely girl, and <laughs> she's probably been in his ear, go on, give us a break, we're only trying to do our job. But he, he was just in such good spirits, and I think that's such a powerful combination for the team, him plus Lance. And, yeah, as you pointed out last week, TC, Lance has left Bahrain with a whole legion of new fans who were just so impressed with how deeply he dug to in order to perform that week. And actually not just race, but perform, you know, score decent haul of points. I've broken my wrist, as I say. I'm going to milk it five times. It is so <laughs> painful. I still have pain for it now, <laughs> years later. Pinks, you said that last week. Quickly, how, how have you broken your wrists five times? I'm so accident prone. I No, I broke both arms twice when I was a kid. And then I was doing kettlebells, as you do, in the garden. And the broken wrist popped back out. This is like 25 years later. And the person I was training with said to me, I don't think your wrist is supposed to look like that. And I looked down and the bone was sticking out. <laughs> and then they fixed it and then they had to do it again a year later so yeah me and Lance we bond over our breaks chaps can we talk about Mercedes because I have been hearing so many different mixed messages from the team throughout the Bahrain weekend Lewis on Friday was visibly downbeat Saturday his mood seemed to change it felt like they made really significant progress overnight you know maybe I'm overhyping it there but after quali Toto was pretty down and then after the race even though I thought fifth and seventh wasn't too bad I thought you know it was damage limitation given that they didn't have hugely high hopes about taking on Red Bull Ferrari perhaps this is part of the issue Aston Martin a customer team maybe that's really rubbing salt in the wounds but they've just sent out a letter to their fans talking about well I suppose it's a rousing speech in a way trying to encourage more support from their fans and discourage the negativity on social media. But I'll just read you a little bit about it. It won't be easy, but where's the value in something easy? These are the times when character is forged, the times when a team becomes greater than the sum of its parts, tackling difficult problems and conquering them. We're together through thick and thin, from Toto, Lewis and George to every single woman and man in the factories in Brackley and Brixworth, and we love that challenge. What do you think, Damon? I think it sounds like something out of Gladiator. 
you know, maybe Russell Crowe should have read it. Um, it's, a, it's a rousing pre-battle speech, isn't it? It's basically, we know we're down, but we're fighters and we're going to come back. And But it was, I definitely, uh, and I did note this response to some of the negativity and there, were, there was an emphasis on keeping it civil because I think in this day and age now, we, we're all aware that when, let's say you work for uh, an organisation and this has cropped up in the past with regard to Red Bull as well, um, you know, sometimes the people who work for the teams now get abused on social media because they've, let's say, in some rather naive or misguided people's minds, they are responsible for Lewis Hamilton or whoever their favourite driver is from not getting the car he wants. So it's a blessing and, and a curse in a way, having this driver as good and as famous as Lewis Hamilton in your team. People are loyal to him and they're not necessarily loyal to the team he's driving for. They they just want the team to provide him with the, the fast car. So I can imagine there's been a, a lot of stress back at the factory because of that. I was just surprised that this happened just one race in. But perhaps the abuse has been too much, Damon. Perhaps you're right. Perhaps this is all in response to negativity online. And these performance levels is uncharted territory for Mercedes. Let's not forget that. You know, last year we thought, or they thought, I'm sure, was a blip. Oh, we'll get back to winning ways regularly uh, in 2023. And that's looking difficult, isn't it? So they're having to manage expectations from fans. I think there's probably a lot of internal management as well. What about James Valls? I know that when Mick Schumacher joined Mercedes at the end of last year, it was James Valls who sorted out his contract. So the fact that James has left would suggest that it's very last minute and there's a hole that needs to be filled there. The team, I feel, is in a state of flux and while George can grow with the new look Mercedes somewhat for Lewis, you can see it's a stress because he's running out of time to get that eighth championship. And has crucially confirmed that he will not leave the sport until he's done just that, which is music to the ears of his fans. But is it going to be in a Mercedes car? Is he going to be able to do that in a Mercedes? Nat, you, you mentioned the mixed messages because after the race, he, he got on the radio and said, you know, we've got work to do, guys. I'm right behind you, 100% supportive. And then there was this line that came out to say, I did warn them. I told them I didn't like the car. It was something, you know, and you kind of go, well, you can't criticize and and also be 100% supportive. You know, it's, um, I mean, there's, there's obviously constructive criticism, but he's disappointed. He knows what's ahead. And I mean, Tom, what is with the cost cap? What is the possibility? What are the limitations? Even if they've got the people there now, at Mercedes, who know what the answer is, how can they produce a, a new? They can, because is it a new car? Or is it a completely redesigned car? There's something they're not done. The car looks different to everyone else's. So people are saying, well, that must be the reason. It looks different. I mean, maybe it's not that. Maybe it's something else. But, Damon, talk to the aero guys up and down the pit lane and they'll say the last thing they're actually looking at is the shape of the side pods. There's so much more going on aerodynamically with these cars than what the, the side pods themselves are doing. It's a huge question, isn't it? And with the budget cap, can they... You know, Back in the day, three years ago, Mercedes would have just gone back to the drawing board and, and brought a brand new car for the start of the European season at Imola. Uh, now, the budget cap means they can't do that. So you're just having to maximise what you've got. I think we will see, I think Toto said we will see a, a different looking car. Um, Pinks, was it from Baku? I think we might see a different looking car from Mercedes. But how much difference that's going to make... We're going to have to wait to find out, aren't we? But I would suggest that on the evidence of where Red Bull are in particular, but with with uh, Aston Martin's pace. and I mean, hey, I'm going to just parrot fashion, repeat what Alonso said last weekend. Do not judge on one race. We've got three very different racetracks for the first three races. As, as we've been saying, Saudi is a very different type of racetrack to Bahrain and Australia is different again. Let's make a judgment about the pecking order after Australia and not before. Don't forget that you can keep across all the action of the F1 season with F1 TV. The new cars, the new drivers and addition of the new Vegas track are set to make 2023 a season to remember. And F1 TV Pro subscribers can stream coverage for all sessions live and on demand. Enjoy exclusive features such as driver onboards, team radios and live data insights to get the ultimate viewing experience. 
And if you want to get behind the scenes of the Grand Prix race weekend, the F1 TV presenters have got you covered with their team interviews, pre-race and technical shows. Now streaming across your favourite devices, including Samsung and Apple TV, Roku and Amazon Fire TV. Perfect if you ever want to set up multiple screens with live leaderboards and trackside data, allowing you to compare driver lap times while watching the action. You'll feel like you've got your very own pit wall, no matter where you end up tuning in. And for a limited time, F1 are offering a seven-day free trial for F1 TV Pro subscribers. Simply go to f1tv.com to sign up and take your race weekend to the next level. F1 TV Pro is only available in select territories, so please do check the website for more details and full terms and conditions. Offer ends Sunday 19th of March. Before we start our preview of the Saudi Grand Prix, let's get the thoughts of four-time Formula One world champion Alain Prost. I've been speaking to him for this week's special episode of F1 Beyond the Grid, which is out on Wednesday. And I just had to get his reflections on the season opener. It was a small surprise, in fact. Many surprises, a few few things that we all uh, expect that, for example, the, the strong Red Bull, we all expected that, even even before the test, one week before, because they were good uh, last year, they understand uh, the new regulation, they are quite reliable now, so there's no reason why they should uh, should lose the small advantage, at least. Surprised it now, I would be more like the Mercedes. Did not get back to where we all expected that uh, would be better than last year. They are not, so at least they recognize that, so it, it's quite a surprise. Ferrari, I, I was expecting maybe a better, even better uh, performance, especially in race condition. I thought they would, uh, they would improve a little bit. And obviously, the Aston is a big surprise. But uh, very honestly, when you look at the season last year, the, the second part of the season, they really managed to have a big effort and they managed to uh, recover uh, quite a big lot. You know, everybody's surprised that they are you know, and the sort of difference of the two seconds per lap, uh, which is enormous. But, you know, if you are uh, really far away and you start to manage to understand how it's working and then you you, you put everything all together, why not? It's not, uh, it's not a problem, you know? So, that, but that is a surprise the way that they, they managed to recover and uh, the performance in the rest condition is really impressive. Honestly, uh, we have to wait for a few a few races before we we comment that. But it's not exactly what we expected to have at the first race. So let, let's see what happens in, uh, in Jeddah. OK, let's look forward to this weekend then. Can't wait. The 2023 Saudi Arabian Grand Prix. It's a race that could be very different to the season opener. And even Max Verstappen thinks so. Saudi is quite a, a different track to, um, to this one. You have a lot more like straights, fast corners and uh, a lot less deck. And I think here we were particularly good on, on the deck. Um, so I do expect uh, in terms of race space that everyone is closer in, in Jeddah. Yeah. As Matt said there, in Bahrain, Red Bull didn't suffer with tyre degradation as much as Ferrari. Any teams that did struggle to make their tyres last in Bahrain should find Saudi easier. That's partly because the track surface in Jeddah is smoother, so it doesn't wear out the tyres at such a fast rate. There are other reasons to think that the field might be closer in Saudi. Jeddah has fewer slow and medium speed corners, where Red Bull are particularly strong. But it does have long, full throttle sections, and that'll help Ferrari. Their car is very fast on long straights. It seems to have a higher top speed than Red Bull. And the super long pit straight in Jeddah will suit the Ferrari very well and could help them if the race becomes a DRS fight, just like last year. They're going to be racing to the chequered flag here. Out of the final corner, Max Verstappen emerges in front. Such a close battle once again. And this time around, it's Max Verstappen that wins out. He takes victory in the Saudi Arabian Grand Prix. And Charles Leclerc comes home in second place. That is victory for Max Verstappen. And it wasn't by much. Just half a second. Okay. Oh, <laughs> nice. <laughs> That was good. That was good. Wow, that was close. Wow. Unbelievable. Well done, Max. Great, great job. 
well done for Max. That was nice. Now, who would have thought, guys, after that Saudi Arabian Grand Prix last year, that Red Bull were going to win, or were going to run away with the championship? I mean, what an extraordinary race! It was good, wasn't it? It was a tight competition. It was a tight race. It bode well for the the championship, didn't it? But of course, they've run away with the first race of the season. Um, so maybe when we get back together, they'll uh, have a little bit more competition from from others, Ferrari particularly. Well. I, for one, really enjoyed the race there last year. If I'm completely honest, it did feel incredibly tense in the build-up to it. There was a lot of things going on, and it was something of a relief to me that we were able to talk about great racing come Sunday night. Yeah, it was amazing. There was, and, it, and do you know what? The great racing was throughout the field. Do you remember Alonso and Ocon, wheel to wheel, until one of them was given team orders? Uh, but yeah, that battle at the front, was extraordinary and who'd bet against Ferrari against Red Bull this year Ferrari are certainly hoping that the quicker corners are gonna are gonna favor their car more than in Bahrain and I can't wait to see how Aston Martin will cope here I know that you've said just wait and see don't jump to conclusions but I think if anyone is going to wring the neck of that Aston Martin around this street circuit it'll be our Spanish friend yeah, I think, I think what's going to be really important uh, and as an indicator of how the season will pan out is going from Bahrain to Saudi, which is a different type of circuit. It's going to give a pointer as to whether there's any chink in the armour for Red Bull and whether it actually is track specific. The performance may be Ferrari will be much more competitive and a circuit with less tyre deg, um, certainly in race conditions and, and also their horsepower as well. But Aston Martin... And now I've got, kind of created an expectation that they're going to be brilliant to every event. So uh, they're, they're going to find out that, uh, you know, you've got to keep it up if you're going to do well. Well, Alonso's been there, done it, hasn't he? He knows that you don't want to put too much pressure on yourself if you're worried that you're going to uh, not be able to deliver over the balance of a season. And yet he was talking it all up after the race in Bahrain. Bring on the next race. He said, this is just the beginning of the development of this car. You know, it's 95% new compared to last year's car. We know less about this car than any other team on the grid knows about their car. There is so much potential in this Aston. So I think if, if Aston Martin are quick this weekend, then I know Alonso says, let's wait three races. But I think we'll have a pretty good indication that they're going to be there or thereabouts everywhere and and what about Lance Stroll one of my favorite bits pinks of last week's show was Stroll giving us his rundown of everything he's been through in the last two weeks I, I you're the expert when it comes to broken bones and how much this extra 10 days he's had in recovery how much better will his his wrists be well I, I'm sure I'm, I'm no doctor but I'm sure it will make a massive difference I found it really interesting the way he wanted to give us a blow-by-blow account of what he's been through. I felt like it was a release, almost like a therapy session for him, being able to finally talk about it. Uh, he'd been very quiet, kept his cards very close to his chest in the build-up to the race. But afterwards, it was like this massive release for him. So, yeah, phenomenal job. And uh, every day that passes, it's uh, it's aiding his recovery well, it's a good point because he said, didn't he, that one of the things he was nervous of was the little snaps of oversteer that you get in a car. He said, I was nervous of that because it, what it was it going to feel like, was it going to give me pain in my wrists? And as that subsides, then I think, and he's, and he's able to focus even more on the driving rather than worrying about how the car's going to react because it might hurt him, then I think we're going to see an even more competitive lance. Absolutely, particularly at a circuit like Jeddah. I was very impressed. Everyone was very impressed, and, and you're right, Natalie. He was he was very keen to tell the story, not not in a way to boast, but I mean, he he had kept it all quiet. But the the detail of what he'd gone through was quite amazing, and I think it shown a side to to Lance that we hadn't seen before. It may be one of those opportunities that just unexpectedly come up and show the kind of metal that the guy's got and the determination uh, to get back. I can relate to what happened. I actually had a plum drive in Form 3000 all lined up and I was you know, a struggling racing driver. I could not afford to miss this opportunity and before the start of the season in 1990, I was motorcycling with some friends and I, I did the same thing, fell off and broke my wrist. But I was terrified of telling anyone. 
I was invited to come up to the team and I said, I can't come up. I made all sorts of excuses because my arm was in plaster. I thought, if they see that, they'll just get someone else. So uh, I kept it quiet on my end and I, and I went through all the physiotherapy with a broken wrist and, and, and finally had to sort of, the, the time came when I had to get in the car and drive it. But I had to take the plaster off and um, it was um, with the gear lever as well. So it was right my right hand wrist, which is the one that does all the gear changing. A bit painful for a while, but I was so determined not to lose that opportunity. And, he, and that Lance definitely just demonstrated that he was not going to let anyone else drive that car. He was going to make a comeback. And so very impressed with his performance. Well, Damon, I'd love to jump in there and say that having your arms in plaster can actually be an opportunity. An opportunity for me, because it's 20 odd years ago, I had my arm in plaster from the knuckles right the way up to the armpit on both sides. (laughs) And it was the only time that I have been in the school orchestra because they gave me a stick. I was in percussion and they would do the string section and then they would direct over to me and I'd go, Soon as the plaster came off, I was back out of the school orchestra. You could have just tapped your plaster. You could just tapped your plaster or something in time to the music. Or just kept the, <laughs> the manky old plaster for, for weeks and months later. Please keep me. Please keep me. At what point in that 1990 season did you fess up and tell the team? Um, eventually, I did, but um, it was a bit of a hairy moment because actually that was my big break. No pun intended. If I'd lost that drive, I wouldn't have been driving for Williams, and I wouldn't have been world champion. Literally, and it was ha- that was how important it was. I had no fallback at all. Oh, that's another pun. I just realised because <laughs> I actually did fall back and broke. My- that's how I broke my wrist. <laughs> anyway, but getting back to Lance, you know, it was about. I mean, that was a big shunt. And listening to him describe the gory details is is a brave lad for um, for persevering and getting in the car and driving. I I put him down as a no hope at the start of that race. So interesting, Damon, because. People jump on the lazy assumption that he is only there because of his dad. Okay, obviously his father's wealth and purchase of the team has facilitated his career, but this was his first opportunity to prove that he's not some spoiled kid that just everything lands on his lap. He took it with both hands and was able to really prove himself. And actually, I think in time, he'll be really grateful for that opportunity. He's silenced a lot of critics. Finally. Yeah, really good points. The first time the outside world has seen him fight to get into a car. Because the assumption, as you say, is that there's been the red carpet treatment all the way through from Formula 3 upwards. And yet here he was, not going to miss this opportunity. I'm not going to let Drogovic in or Stoffel van Dorn in because I don't want to give them the opportunity to prove how good they are. I have to get in that car and show the world. And and boy, did he do that. They're, they're tough, these Canadians. You know, Canadians are typically, you know, they all play ice hockey, don't they? They can take a few knocks. If you're looking for a simple and effective way to protect your privacy and data when using the internet, then look no further than NordVPN. If you're anything like me, you likely find yourself working remotely or accessing unsecure networks like public Wi-Fi when you're on the move. And without the right protection, this can leave your personal information at risk. What's great about NordVPN is that it doesn't matter whether you're at home, traveling or simply out shopping and socializing, NordVPN will keep your data away from prying eyes. All you need to do to protect your devices is hit connect and you're sorted. To make things even easier, you can enable auto connect, which gives you immediate peace of mind that you're browsing safely and securely each time you go online without even thinking about it. You can protect up to six devices with each NordVPN account, which is handy if you're switching between your mobile or laptop. And it's compatible with every major platform, including Windows, Android, iOS, macOS and Linux. Even your Android TV supports NordVPN. And the speeds are amazing, so it won't affect your internet connection, allowing you to go along with your business while it works its magic in the background. So grab your exclusive NordVPN deal by going to nordvpn.com f1 nation to get a huge discount off your NordVPN plan, plus a bonus gift. It's completely risk-free with Nord's 30-day money-back guarantee. What about Lewis Hamilton then and this W14? I mean, after the race, he said, from the moment I drove this car, I knew what the problem was. The team didn't listen to me. There was that implication as well. I feel that 
he's not a happy camper at the minute. And it's and it's not just the fact that the car is uncompetitive. It's the fact that he told them what he thought and they didn't listen to his advice. Well, it's so interesting, isn't it? Because we have talked a lot about Mercedes no blame culture, but it feels quite far from that at the moment, doesn't it? And it's very difficult to hold on to that mantra when the chips are down. I do believe that the best person place to deal with this kind of adversity is Lewis. Whenever he's on the back foot, you see him come out fighting and actually doing better than could ever be expected. I don't know how this is going to play out. I think they're a brilliant team with a lot of uh, fight, a lot of resource, a lot of intellect. And I'm sure and I hope uh, and I know I speak for a lot of other people when I say I'm sure that they will be able to come through this, but it's not looking good, is it? And if we're talking timelines, this is potentially months away from resolution. Well, and Mike Elliott, the technical director at Mercedes, fantastic mechanical engineer. It'll be fascinating to see what he comes up with because, I don't know, you know, I think Toto Wolf might have given him, an, not an ultimatum, that's probably the wrong word, but I think Mike Elliott has to sort this car out. And if he doesn't, I, you do wonder what his long-term future at the team is. I don't want to pour unnecessary pressure on him. but well, you just have. Thanks, yeah, John. Yeah, but, well, only because I think Toto Wolf has done that by saying this isn't good enough. Yeah. We've got issues. We need to turn this around. And ultimately, it's a technical issue. And Mike is the technical director. You know, it's hard to criticise. You don't want to start saying okay somebody needs to sort this out you know you don't want to you do not want people's jobs are really important and uh the last thing they need is pressure but this is formula one and that's the nature of the beast the nature of the beast is you're in the spotlight it's not a place you can hide away somebody is going to look for where it's right and where it's wrong and if it's an individual that it's that is leading people in the wrong direction then they are going to be put under pressure you know I don't think Bonotto necessarily should have lost his position at Ferrari, but that's what happened. You know, this is the nature of the game. It's tough, and Mercedes are going to have to... You know, Lewis has, has raised the issue. He's come out and said, I did tell them, I told them. You know, they didn't listen. Now, that that's not very supportive. That is, that is putting pressure on. So if anyone's putting pressure on, it's Lewis. I think Lewis puts more pressure by him being in the team than, than anything we could say or do. Um, and they know the problem. They know they've got to sort it out. And that's going to be an opportunity. That's the way Toto puts it. He'll say, this is an opportunity for us to show us what we're made of, you know, to show the world what we're capable of doing. And you'd be foolish to, to write them off and, and, and say they can't fix it. But the underlying problem has been this fundamental car design. And, you know, they all say side pods are not the issue, but their side pods look totally different to everyone else, apart from Williams. And you look at the Aston Martin, and it's and it's it's Red Bull side pods plus, you know, or even Ferrari plus. You know, they these other cars have gone in a completely different direction with that. And Mercedes are still gone for this sort of zero size concept. Uh, so you can't help feeling that there is something fundamentally wrong with that that idea. And and does Toto Wolf does he just have to bolster what he's got, or does he need to rejig? what he's got you know that's that's a question he's going to be asking himself isn't it i think i think he they, they all need to go back to work if you, if you remember at the end of uh was it three years ago or something i can remember them saying that james allison was going to go and do he's going to move back they all tried to move back from the cold face didn't they the top management toto you know take a bit of a breather and that they thought that that Things were running smoothly. They got a great team. It was all going to continue to produce competitive cars. Of course, the new regulations were a big stress point. And from that point onwards, the wheels come off the off the tracks a little bit. And they've had to come back. They've had to change plan. They've had to go get their heads stuck back in the in the engine room and um, and and sort it out. It's so interesting, isn't it? Because I feel that the reaction to the Bahrain Grand Prix weekend was just this thinking feeling that they hadn't overcome their problems and that there was a glimmer of hope coming into the season that was quickly snubbed out after the the weekend, which is why I thought, you know, fifth and seventh wasn't that bad. And yet 
it probably was for them. And perhaps they were sort of erring on the side of optimism until that point. It just felt like the pe- a penny drop moment, don't you think? Yes, I think they'd had that penny drop moment in testing, actually, because uh, George Russell went back to the factory after testing to get back into the simulator because mm. I think they were thinking the performance isn't where we want it to be. And mind you, he has an incredible stamina. The team were telling him, I said, gosh, for him to go back when there's only three days between the end of the test and the start of the first race, they said, oh, he regularly does that. Last year, he went back after the Mexican Grand Prix to get on the simulator in Brackley in the UK. He then the following weekend had to be in Las Vegas for the launch where you were, of course, Mm. Pinkle. And then he went on to Brazil after that. But he'll quite happily fly halfway across the world just to get on the simulator to keep the information flowing and keep trying to make progress. Yeah, you know what, though? It takes its toll. I mean... Well, in Lewis moment, does that the whole time, course, doesn't he? Give it your, your, well, you'll give it your all in the moment, but that does ultimately take its toll. He's young though, isn't he? He's young, he can handle it. But I do think travelling isn't great for the body and mind. Even if you are going in a private jet or business class, first class, whatever, it's 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 not healthy. It's not the healthy choice. So I think there's, there's short-term solutions. I think they need to take a you know, more of a helicopter view of it all. Ian, if the people listening haven't listened to Tom's uh, episode of Beyond the Greed on um, the Brackley Boys. Oh, it's so good. Yeah, you've got to listen to that because it it tells you the story of how this team came to be, where they are and how successful they are, uh, you know, and, and the key people who, who held them together. And the worry is always with Formula One is it, you, there's burnout. There has to be at some point the nucleus of a team, the key personnel at, who work as a and and bring about the success, they can't keep doing it forever. It's almost impossible. The fact that Adrian Newey is still there pumping out successful cars beats me. But you look at him now, he, he looks really tired. <laughs> sorry, sorry, Adrian, but you still look, you know, you can't help it. He's so competitive, he will not give it up. But uh, eventually it becomes exhausting. And with all these things, Damon, it is cyclical. You can't be on top forever people will always catch up that's the nature of the game isn't it yeah i'm just going back to the bahrain weekend though tom i don't know about you but i definitely sensed a gear change from friday to saturday and then it seemed to go backwards again come sunday checkered flag i think this is a difficult car uh remember in testing they had a very good day one they were nowhere on day two and i'm quoting the team when they say nowhere it's not me um you know trying to sensationalized the point they were nowhere on the second day and then they brought it back again on day three so i think the working window if we can call it that uh, of this year's mercedes is difficult so therefore as you say pinks you can make a big step forward one day and then find yourself taking half a step back again the next day and, and ultimately they just... the only day that matters is the sunday yeah you know? they just need more miles with it to um you know, to get on top of it. Yeah. But similar problems, you could say, down at McLaren in that their car in testing, it seemed nowhere. And the team were actively managing expectations, saying, look, we're not where we want to be. Lando then qualifies 11th in Bahrain and then has a horrible race, makes, what is it? What was it? Six pit stops? Five. Five pit stops. Yeah. That's what. Uh, that's as many as you made at the Donington Grand Prix in 93, Damon. But so Lando had lots of, Uh, issues with his car and then of course Oscar Piastri had to retire with an electronics problem but do we think McLaren can bounce back they're currently P10 in the Constructors Championship how do we see them bouncing back this weekend James Key was saying that the problem was they were going down a route and then the rule change came in the 1.5 centimetre rule change came in and they kind of realised they couldn't go that way and now they're, they're I think from the sounds of it they're halfway up the stairs They've got to go back down to the bottom and start climbing again in a different direction, a different stair. That's mixing my stair staircase metaphors here. But anyway, they got caught out. That's what he was saying. It's going to take until Baku, I think he said, um, which is great because I'm going to Baku. So um, you can ask about it there. OK, so it's going to be hard for them this weekend and it's going to rely on Lando's brilliance to drag it up the order. And, you know, poor Oscar Piastri, you know, he's just trying to learn about Formula One and he's having to do it in a far from ideal car. But but there's some positives to take from that. He can actually stay under the radar somewhat. If he was in a hugely competitive car, 
trying to hold his own against Lando Norris, it might be more difficult. I'm sure he'd prefer to be in, in a better car. But I think just for now, at this stage in his career, it's not all doom and gloom. Our next partner is Athletic Greens. I take AG1 by Athletic Greens literally every day. I gave AG1 a try because I was looking for a way to optimise full body health without the need for buying multiple vitamins and supplements. And I found it to be the perfect accompaniment to help me achieve my fitness goals. It's so much more than just a nutritional drink. With just one scoop mixed in water, you're getting 75 high quality ingredients. And it can help balance your immune system, improve energy and provide long-term gut health support. It's become an integral part of my daily routine and I really notice a difference in my energy levels on the days I work out when I take AG1. My recovery time is much better and if I take it first thing in the morning, I feel much more hydrated and ready to tackle the day. It's such a small change to my routine that reaps huge benefits. And knowing that my body is getting all the key nutrients it craves to perform at its best really inspires me to stick to my health and fitness routine, especially on those days when I might need a little more motivation. And it could be the same for you. If a comprehensive solution is what you need from your supplement routine, then Athletic Greens is giving you a free one year supply of vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. Go to athleticgreens.com slash F1 Nation. That's athleticgreens.com slash F1 Nation. Check it out. Well, guys, it's time to welcome our guest. Delighted to say that CEO of the Saudi Arabian Grand Prix, Martin Whitaker, is with us now. Martin, great to have you with us. How's progress over there? Thank you, Tom. It's good to see you all. Uh, yeah, it's really good. I think um, we had a we had a meeting with the Minister of Sport last night, and he was saying to me, he said, um, are you worried? Are there any red flags? And I said, yeah, I'm a bit like you. I have, nobody said anything. So we're sort of it's it's looking pretty good at the moment. I mean, the, the, I have to say the circuit looks phenomenal. Uh, when you get here, if you if you guys are coming, I'm sure you are. The the place looks magnificent. A lot of changes. And let's face it, we're a year on. Although, would you believe it? Three Grand Prix in 16 months is is some challenge. But you'll see a lot of differences here in, in both outside and inside the track. Come on, then tell us about the differences to the track itself. Well, I th- I think for a start, Natalie, it looks a lot more mature. Um, so it's sort of grown up. The palm trees actually now look like proper palm trees. And just the whole sort of guest journey is a lot better. So when you arrive at the circuit, all the roads have now been finished. So they've all got proper pavements. They've got proper lighting. I mean, that sounds like a ridiculous thing to say. But if you remember ahead of the first race, uh, they, they, we, the municipality had dug up all the roads. Admittedly, to make it look better, it's just that we didn't get it finished in time. So the place just looks a lot more professional. On track, of course, there are uh, more changes again. Uh, the drivers are going to be, I think, really quite pleased because obviously the first time they're going to chance to have a look will be when they walk around on Thursday. But during the winter months, we've um, again made some quite interesting changes to improve the sight lines. So on five of the corners, we moved the fences back by anything between two and seven metres. So uh, in some places, it's quite a marked um, change to the overall look and feel of the circuit. Uh, and I'm sure you will walk around yourselves and you'll notice what I mean. Uh, then we've also removed the steel plates that we put in on the inside of a number of the corners. You remember, I think we were talking about it last time, about how the, the concrete barriers effectively are edged to go around a corner. So they have shoulders. So we've actually, the FIA said, no, we're quite happy with those. Let's remove the steel plates. So we've removed those from six corners. There is a change to one of the corners, so as I think you understand the, the racing, the, the perimeter of the track has not changed apart from in one place. And that is 22-23, uh, uh, which if you remember, I think was the corner where did Carlos go off there last year by the small mosque just underneath the Royal Overlook. That corner has been tightened. So that will make that corner probably 30 kilometers slower. So therefore, they will be going on to the, the, effectively the back straight or that long curve between 23 and 27. Uh, they'll be entering that at a slower pace. So it'll be interesting to see how that works out. Any idea what it's going to do to lap times? Well, I, I, to be honest, Tom, I think we're just going to have to see when they get there. I'm sure people have modelled it. I'm not aware of the modelling of it. It will reduce the lap time somewhat, but probably not an awful lot. 
I mean, effectively, you could argue that improved sight lines could even give uh, drivers greater confidence through some of the corners, so we might see even greater speeds through some of the corners. What does our racing driver think of that? Hamer's buried his head in his hands. Yeah, I, 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 this should be you. <laughs> you should be like this. Martin, you mentioned you did three Grand Prix in 16 months. I mean, that must be some sort of record. Um, of course, to remind uh, our listeners that what happened was we first went to Saudi at the end of 21, and then 2022 is this, uh, one of the first races. So it's a hell of a ramp up. Um, how, how has it been received in Saudi? Has, has there been a noticeable increase in interest? in the country, in Grand Prix, in Formula 1? We'll be full over Grand Prix weekend. I I think you've made an interesting point, Damon. I think Formula 1 has played a a, a huge role in developing the interest in the sport. And and as I think you're also aware, one of my roles here is to head up Saudi Motorsport Company, which is all about the development of motorsport in this country. Uh, And there's no doubt about it, Formula 1, the interest in Formula 1, certainly from where we were in December 21, to where we are here in March 23 is, uh, is again, uh, a, a lot, lot different. And people have much more knowledge of the sport. They have a greater understanding of who the drivers are, who the teams are. So there's a, there's a much greater understanding. Don't get me wrong. I mean, clearly there was an understanding before Formula 1 came here, but it's even more so now. And, of course, also the circuit plays a much bigger part in the overall community of Jeddah. So we're running events here now on a, on a regular basis throughout throughout the year, whether it's corporate events, whether it's track days, other races. You remember in, in November, December of last year, we had the, the final round of the of the, w, the World Touring Car Championship. Um, so we've got other races coming on board now. We, the track is open to people going cycling, people going running. We've even got the triathlon club coming here as well. So there's a lot, lot more going on. So there's a much greater awareness of the circuit and what it stands for. And are there more people getting involved in grassroots racing as a result of the Grand Prix? Yeah, I'm delighted. I and mean, one of the things we lack here, of course, is circuits. Um, there are a couple of other circuits, but nothing that is of a standard that really would allow the, the strong development of the sport. So one of the things that we're working on, uh, we hope to be able to announce probably in the next couple of months, is the development of a new club circuit here in Jeddah. It'll be alongside the, uh, the Sports City Stadium, where the football stadium is which again is a, is a big area which allows the development of a club circuit together with academies for karting, uh, bikes, drifting, and of course, drag racing. So there is a, there's a huge interest now in developing the sport further. And, and as a result, that karting is obviously the place where we're starting. Karting clearly is likely important, as we all know. And I think the, the development of karting is then going to lead to the development of junior formula in the, in the not-too-distant future. Wow. Gosh. Busy times over there. Now, look, there's one point I've got written down in front of me, Martin. Rumble lines. Is it true that these have been added at certain corners? You know, like downhill skiing, where you have the the snow is blue to sort of give the the skiers a chance to sort of see where they're going. Have we got that kind of thing going on in Jeddah in Formula One now, but with a rumble line? No, there are. I mean, the rumble, it's difficult to explain what they are. They look like sort of elongated, I suppose, cat's eyes sort of the size of a, so- of a sausage and I'm going to get slaughtered. But yeah, so that's fairly what they are. And, and I think really it's quite simple. They are on the inside. They're on the inside of the apex. Uh, they probably stretch for however long they need to stretch on the inside of a number of corners, particularly the corners where we've opened up to sort of between five and seven meters. And effectively, as a driver, you're just going to you're just gonna feel those. I mean, one amusing note was that they thought that if we had them at varying intervals, that they would actually play a tune as you go along. So I gather they do this on certain autobahns in Germany. Is this right? That if you go on the rumble strips, it plays a musical tune? I know that as you approach Mount Fuji in Japan, there is a rumble section of track which play, and it and if you're at 60 kilometers an hour, it plays the Japanese national anthem. There you go. Oh, that's amazing. I mean, the trouble is people will be starting to go along those rumble strips just to hear the tune, won't they? That's, that's the problem. It's going to encourage people to drive off yeah. the road but um, and the fans will be going come on play it um, but I've got a serious question Martin which is how much because there was a bit of consternation when we when we first went there it was very fast blind corners and all the rest of it I think the drivers are slightly concerned and some of these changes have been instigated listening to the drivers how much of what the drivers have said about the circuit has been a contributing factor has any one particular driver been a spokesperson to help change the circuit to suit or what well, uh, I mean, that's a very good question, Damon. And obviously the drivers have expressed concerns about those sidelines. Look, let's get this 
correct before we go any further. I think the drivers love the track. I think they love the fact that it's fast. They love the challenge of it. They love the surface, don't forget, because the one thing that we always wanted to make sure in that build up to race one was that, that the time, the actual surface was quick and everything like that. And I think we've, we've dispelled any, any theories about what they were going to be delivered. So that's great. But yeah, um, obviously, we've done all the changes very much in, in, in league with Formula One and with uh, the FIA. Both of them have been very involved. And clearly, the F1 team, originally through Ross, they engaged with the GPDA and particularly with people like George to make sure that we were doing what we could do. Now, we haven't been able to do everything purely because of a time, but more importantly, the, the location. As you know, this is actually a very narrow strip of land. So we're actually operating on a quite a narrow strip. So therefore, we can't do everything. And also, you can't bridge posts and what have you in the way on certain corners if we went further back. But in answer to your question, Damon, yes, we, we have engaged drivers and they have been involved, admittedly through, through Formula One, not through ourselves. It's so interesting, isn't it? Because you do need to listen to the drivers because they are, after all, the ones taking this circuit on. Um, as you say, when we've spoken to them, they, they, they love the pace of this. They and the fans love the jeopardy of it as well. That's why Checo said it made it all the sweeter that he was able to nail the perfect quali lap there last year. It's because it's tough. It's a de very difficult circuit. But equally, when you've seen a couple of big crashes like Mick Schumacher's, it's scary times and you have a, a duty to protect them. Good point, Natalie. I should have mentioned as well, we have changed the curbs. One of the issues, if you remember, was the track was designed and constructed in the 21-era car. And therefore, when we got to the 22-era car, I imagine that there will be other circuits who face this issue as well. The curbs did not work well with the modern-era car. And as a result, the 22 design. And so to that end, we've changed pretty much all of the curbs as well. They're much smoother up and a much decreased angle on the back side of the curb so that you won't get a car effectively losing traction when it gets on top of the curb. You've been out there in Arabia now for quite a time, haven't you? So you, you're, you know, you're well, you've seen this whole journey of interest from Abu Dhabi as well. Um, how long have you been out there now? I started here in, uh, in 2003 when the, when the Bahrain circuit was under construction. And then I, I effectively ran the circuit in Bahrain from 2004. So, yeah, so I've, I've been here a fair while. And, it, and it, yeah, and it's great to see the development of the sport taking part of the region, as you say. Not only do you now have the race in Abu Dhabi and clearly the one initially in Bahrain, Saudi, and now being joined as well by Qatar as well. So you've got four significant races in this part of the world. So I thought I'd ask you some questions since you've been there so long and you know so much. I mean, in both kilometers and miles, how long is the Jeddah Street Circuit? In terms of kilometers and miles, I mean, kilometers is six point, just under 6.2. But in terms of miles, yes. oh, thank you, Rosie. No one who asked me the, what sort of crime of pounds of milk are you? <laughs> what is the population of Jeddah? It's approximately 4 million. 4.6. Four. Oh, well, there you go. It's increased since I last looked. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone there's a man who knows his stuff. And it's brilliant to see you thriving and also spreading motorsport throughout the region, uh, Martin, you know, because it takes a brave man to go out there and, and get stuck in. That's the most exciting thing. I think it's about seeing young people getting involved in the sport, seeing the potential for the development of the sport in this part of the world. It's not just Saudi, by the way. You know, we're, we're working now with the FIA on helping to spread the Middle East Rally Championship, for example. So there's a lot of opportunity here. And as, as you well know, we're looking at other sports. But more importantly, we're also looking at about creating our own sports here. We're creating circuit and rally programs, which are Saudi, have its only IP, Saudi owned, uh, where you eventually will have not only Saudi drivers, but you have Saudi engineers and Saudi technicians and people just working in logistics and everything else with it. So we've seen the development of the Marshalls Club and things of this nature. That, to me, is the most exciting thing. And it, it, you know, it's really engaging with young people and seeing the value that we can deliver or the sport can deliver. And that's where Formula One has made a huge difference because it has, it has helped spread the message. If you feel like all you do is spend your money on groceries these days, stop what you're doing for a minute and listen closely. Because with iBotter, you can get something back for every shopping trip you take. 
Ibotter is the easiest way to earn cash back on hundreds of grocery items from produce and personal care to pantry goods across hundreds of online brands and retailers, including Macy's, Sephora and Best Buy. In fact, the average Ibotter user earns $120 a year in real cash back. Think of what a difference that could make if you're looking for an easy way to save for a special treat. All you need to do is link your loyalty account or upload your receipt after your shopping trip to claim your cash back. When you consider that a typical basket of groceries was more than $50 more expensive at the end of 2022 than it was at the beginning of the year due to inflation, we'll all be feeling the pinch. And I think it's fantastic to know that you could earn two and a half times that in cash back. I especially love that Ibotta gives you real cash back, not points, which often don't return much value. You can cash out to your bank account, PayPal or gift cards and spend it on something you truly love. Right now, Ibotta is offering our listeners $5 just for trying Ibotta by using the code NATION when you register. Just go to the App Store or Google Play Store and download the free Ibotta app and use the code NATION. That's I-B-O-T-T-A in the Google Play or App Store and use the code NATION. Martin, I'm really intrigued as to whether you're competitive with the other three races in the region or you work together collectively because I can see why Rising Tide lifts all ships and actually you can make it the area. I mean, you've got four races, as you say, in the region, but you must all want to be the jewel in the crown because all of them are spectacular in their own way. They are. I mean, I think as again, it's an interesting question. Look, I think I think there's a there is a healthy competition between us. I think also we all get on really well. There is a there's a very good sort of it's almost like a club of Middle East circuits. For example, we're working really strongly with Qatar in 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 helping to develop the Middle East Rally Championship. Um, and those are, that's the same team that obviously is running Formula One. I, I think the other thing to think about, of course, is that we tend to think that, yeah, there are four races here. But if you think about it, the distance between here and Bahrain alone, and we're the furthest circuit west, the distance between here and Bahrain is pretty much the distance between Budapest and, and Silverstone. And I don't know how many, Tom probably will work this out in five. Actually, Damon, I could ask you this question. That's a better way of approaching it. I, I don't know either. I don't know. Uh-huh. You just said it's the same distance from Budapest to Silverstone. So it's whatever that distance. Yeah, so, so in a sense... You know, and don't forget, you didn't ask me the population of, of Saudi. So I think that's what, 36 million people live here. And yes, we're a lot bigger than Bahrain and we're a lot bigger than obviously Qatar and, and the UAE. But nevertheless, it just shows the opportunity that, that exists. And don't forget, the Middle East is now a massive transportation hub for just about everybody who wants to travel anywhere. If you're leaving London or anywhere in Europe, if you're going to either the Middle East or you're going anywhere else, whether it's the Maldives, India, uh, and further afield to the Far East and Australia and, and New Zealand, the likelihood is, the chance is that you're going to stop off at one of the, at one of the uh, transportation hubs here. And that will only help to deliver a greater attendance at the sport and a greater interest in the sport as the years go on. Martin, you, you've told us about your career in the Middle East, but uh, for those who aren't aware, you also used to run Ford's motorsport program for them and before you go i'd love to just get your thoughts on the blue oval coming back to formula one in 2026 uh, were you surprised to hear about that yeah a little bit um but at the same time i think it's i think it's a fantastic story i mean when i was at ford i was in, obviously incredibly proud to work for ford motor company the heritage in terms of motorsport at ford whether it's formula one rallying or whatever you care to mention is so extraordinary and and you know having a company like ford just for that heritage in the sport alone back on the formula one grid i think is a is a is a huge story and you know i i, I forget damon will answer this but i forget how many grand prix the, the dfv won but it's won a lot you know the ford engine won a lot of formula one more. People tend to forget that. If you're wondering why Damon's not looking at the screen, he's frantically Googling. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm presuming, Damon, you would have won a race with a DFV, would you or not? Nah. I, well, I no, because I did Formula 3000 and my car kept breaking down. That was the only DFV I, I used. I got pole position, but not a win. I, I look back with, with huge pride and, and and great memories of the days with Ford and that relationship with Cosworth. And don't forget, you know, forming the Stuart Grand Prix team with Jackie. 
So they're kind of going home, aren't they? Because it's that same, you know, the, the nucleus of, of Red Bull Racing is Stuart Grand Prix. They're going back into the, in the very same factory that, of course, the Stuart Grand Prix team was running in Milton Keynes, which I think was the SKF Bell Ball Bearings factory to begin with. We've gone full circle. It's coming home. Yeah, it is indeed. Look, Martin, uh, you've got a Grand Prix to go and run. Thank you very much for your time, for your insight, for your answers to Damon's questions, all of it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. It's good to see you. We'll see you in a week or less than a week. Well, great as ever to talk to Martin, who was offers a huge amount of insight into these things. And actually, the one thing that I was most interested in are the changes to the track. You'll remember that last year, the drivers were asking a lot of questions about these blind corners. I mean, it was pretty frightening to watch the lack of visibility when you're riding on board with them. And it sounds as if these sight lines have been improved a lot by moving back the fences. Uh, how do you feel, Damon, as a racer, having such limited visibility? Well, when I first went to the track, I walked it on, cycled it or something, and I just thought, oh, my God, these corners are fast, and you can't see around the corner. And the problem with that is there's nowhere to go if something happens on the other side of that corner in a race. So I was concerned about the lack of visibility. Much, much better to be able to, uh, if you're flat out, uh, drivers will stay flat out. Drivers will keep their foot to the floor, and they'll just hope they can deal with whatever happens if there's something around the corner. But it's not ideal. You know, sure, Monaco, there's places where which are blind corners, going through the tunnel very fast, um, but it's not as fast as Saudi and, and cars slip streaming. Yeah, that was that was a concern for me. You know, you don't want to make it too easy, but at the same time, it's unnecessary to make a very, very fast corner a blind exit. I'm sure the Formula One drivers are going to welcome those changes. Well, let's check in with F1 Fantasy, the game that lets you run your own Formula One team. Race one is done and our team, F1 Nation Racing, made a decent start to the season. Our two constructors for the first race were Red Bull and Aston Martin and our drivers were Verstappen and Alonso and then the rookies, Oscar Piastri, Logan Sargent and Nick De Vries. We scored 242 points. That puts us 75th in our league, the F1 Nation World Championship. We invited you to join the league to compete against us and other listeners and thank you so much if you have. The top of the table looks like this. In first place, first bend bunching with 366 points. They had both Red Bull drivers, Alonso, De Vries and Bottas. Red Bull and Aston Martin were their constructors. Very well done to you. In second place, only two points behind, is Red Bull Fantasy F1 team. No prizes for guessing who you support. And in third, a team that's just called Go Faster. So let's look ahead to Saudi. What are we going to change in our team, if anything? Well, first, let's back Ferrari to have a better weekend and bring in Leclerc in place of Piastri. And let's use our three DRS chip so he scores triple points. Go for it, Charles. Second, let's swap one Williams driver for another and bring in friend of the show, Alex Albon, for Logan Sargent. And let's also make an extra change. Let's swap Nick for Nico. Hulkenberg joins F1 Nation Racing for Saudi. We'll keep Verstappen and Alonso, Red Bull and Aston Martin. And if you'd like to play F1 Fantasy, it is totally free. Just search online for F1 Fantasy to sign up. Then choose your constructors and drivers using a $100 million budget. You have until the start of qualifying on Saturday to make changes to your team for this weekend's race. And you can join our league at any time to compete against us and other listeners. Just search for F1 Nation World Championship. Guys, it's almost time to get on, get on that plane, get over to Jeddah. Are we going to do some predictions? Top three? What do we think? It's going to be different. We're going to realise that Ferrari have got pace. They have got the ability to race. And they'll be all over the back of uh, the Red Bulls with their with the DRS zones and everything. It's going to be great. So Charles Leclerc for the win, says Damon Hill. I agree. I agree. Yeah. So does Natalie Pinkham. Yeah. So does Natalie. So we're all agreeing. Isn't it wonderful? It's love. Love has broken out. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not agreeing. I'm going to say Max Verstappen for the win. I thought they were so dominant. And I think 
even though Max was 38 seconds ahead of the first non-Red Bull, I still think he was trying to win at the slowest possible speed in Bahrain. And although it's a very different track in Saudi, I find it difficult to look beyond Max Verstappen. Don't spoil it, Tom. <laughs> we know we know they've got more up their sleeve. But it's going to be closer. It is going to be closer. They might have a weak spot. They could have, they, you know, we'll push them a bit harder and we'll see where they break, you know. But um, nothing against Red Bull and all those Red Bull fans and uh, Dutch people and Max Verstappen fans. But we want a race, don't we? We all want to see a great race. So come on, Sergio. (laughs) And just before we go, please do keep your questions coming in for Ask the Nation. We want to hear from you. So whatever your query about Formula One, send it over and we'll do our best to answer it. We'll be in the paddock, of course, after the Saudi Arabian Grand Prix. So let's aim to kick this segment off on Monday, the 27th of March, ahead of the Australian Grand Prix. Our thanks to Martin Whitaker for joining us. Well, like Fernando, it's time to say... Bye-bye. Thank you for listening. We'll be back next Monday to review the second race of 2023, the Saudi Grand Prix. F1 Nation is produced by F1 and Audio Boom Studios. See ya. Bye. <laughs> <laughs>